Open up to Mark chapter 13. Father, as we open up your word this morning, we pray that you will give insight into that word. Lord, we ask that you would give us exactly what we need to hear this day. There is so much contained in chapter 13, Lord, we cannot even deal with it all in one day. So we ask that you will just guide this message to the glory of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. The title of today's sermon is Past, Present, or Future. It really doesn't matter. Past, present, or future, it really doesn't matter. Mark chapter 13, open and you can read along with me here. As Jesus was going out of the temple... One of his disciples said to him, Teacher, behold, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another which will not be thrown down. And he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple. Peter and James and John and Andrew were questioning him privately. Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled? And Jesus began to say to them, See to it that no one misleads you. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and will mislead many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be frightened. Those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will also be famines. These things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you to the courts and you will be flogged in the synagogues. And you will stand before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them. The gospel must first be preached to all the nations. When they arrest you and hand you over, do not worry beforehand about what you are to say. But say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but it is the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but the one who endures to the end, he will be saved." But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. The one who is on the housetop must not go down or go inside to get anything out of the house. And the one who is in the field must not turn back to get his coat. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray that it may not happen in the winter. For those days will be a time of tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of the creation which God created until now and never will. Unless the Lord had shortened those days, no life would be, have been saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or behold, He is there. Do not believe him, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show signs and wonders in order to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But take heed. Behold, I have told you everything in advance. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers that are in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send forth his angels and will gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of heaven. Now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. Even so, you too, when you see these things happening, recognize that he is near, right at the door. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. 
But of the day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Take heed, keep on the alert, for you do not know when the appointed time will come. It is like a man away on a journey who, upon leaving his house and putting his slaves in charge, assigning each one his task, also commanded the doorkeeper to stay on the alert. Therefore, be on the alert. For you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening, at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning. In case he should come suddenly and find you asleep, what I say to you, I say to all, be on the alert. Okay, that's self-explanatory. Let's move to chapter 14. Man, if only it was that easy. Chapter 13 is the most difficult chapter in Mark when it comes to our understanding. Now, the temptation is, and some will do this sort of thing, they'll stand up and read a passage like that, and immediately what they'll do is they'll think, oh, I remember seeing that movie. I remember seeing the movie about the apocalypse and about the end times and about all these things that are going to happen. Hey, I read that Hal Lindsey book or I, I listened to Tim LaHaye talk or John Hagee. So I think I'm going to preach what they say instead of preaching what the Bible says. That's a temptation that is there. If you have come to our study, which we've gone through the first, I think, 12 chapters in Revelation, then we took a little hiatus on Wednesday nights. But if you've been coming on Wednesday nights, you know that I have made certain statements like this one. Let's get the Left Behind series out of our heads and let's see what the Bible really says. And that's, that's something that we really need to do, especially in a passage like Mark 13, because these types of passages can be grossly misunderstood and misrepresented. Uh, Anyone can sensationalize Mark 13 so that they can sell a book or make a movie or start a speaking tour. But sensationalization is really not what we are looking for in this church in particular. We want truth, right? I mean, we don't want to just see a Hollywood blockbuster and say that's scripture. You know, I don't care what Nicolas Cage makes. You know, he's starring in the new Left Behind movie. I just don't think he's going to be a good portrayal of what scripture really says or Russell Crowe, or someone along those lines. There is a lot in chapter 13. If anybody thinks I'm going to preach that whole chapter today, get it out of your head. You know me by now. There's too much there. I have finally, after prayer and everything, I was able to decide how I was going to preach this passage. It is going to take me four sermons one of which is a two-parter. This is part one today. Next week will be part two. It's going to take four sermons. The first sermon, which is going to be this week and next, is entitled, Past, Present, or Future, It Really Doesn't Matter. We're going to just look at specifics in there of the prophecies that are stated. Sermon number two, which will be week after next, is going to be called The Many Faces of Deception. Why? Because Jesus starts off, Do not be deceived. Do not be misled. So we're going to actually talk about a sermon based upon this passage and others. What are the many faces of deception? Then the third sermon out of this is going to be in time, do's and don'ts, a practical guide to daily living. I'm getting some long titles here. But in this passage, Jesus gives us a lot of do this and don't do this in the days when the days are coming to an end. Do these things. The final sermon, which we will do, which is a month from now, and then after that, Peter's going to preach a couple of weeks, but the final sermon in this passage is going to be entitled God's Faithfulness Through It All. Because in this passage, we also see God's love and His faithfulness through it all, and in the end times. After Mark 13, then we prepare for the betrayal of, and the crucifixion and the resurrection of our Lord. Past, present, or future, it really doesn't matter. Part one of Sermon One 
Let's begin. Verse 1. And Jesus was going out of the temple. As Jesus was going out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, behold, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. I know one of the blessings that I have had personally in my life is I have been blessed that I've been able to travel. And um, my wife and I have been to places like Rome, you know, last November. And we've seen structures like the Colosseum and St. Peter's Basilica. And we've been to Egypt and we've seen, you know, these grand structures of the pyramids. And we've seen these massive cathedrals throughout Europe that took at times two, three hundred years to build. Talk about a building project. I mean, the big dig didn't even take two hundred years. And some of these massive cathedrals, like the one we saw in Siena last year, two hundred years of construction. You know, we've been on a boat in the Sea of Galilee and we've walked the streets of Jerusalem. And there have been many a time that I, like this disciple, have walked out of a structure. The one time I'm picturing right now in my mind, we came out of the subways in Vienna, Austria, and St. Stephen's Cathedral is there. And it is a massive, massive structure. And we come out and you look up and all you, I mean, you see vertical walls. And, and I, just like this disciple, there have been times when I have just said, wow, behold, behold, what wonderful stones and what a wonderful building. What does that mean? It means, behold what man can do. Look at, look at the way man has been able to build such a structure. I mean, it's so impressive. Jesus is leaving the temple today for the very last time. Jesus will never again step foot in that temple. And that temple by historians like Josephus is recorded to having been beautiful. They said that when you looked at the temple from a distance, it looked like a snow-covered hill. The, the marble was so white and pure. This massive structure sitting up on the temple mount in Jerusalem overshadowing the walls. And Jesus was leaving there today in Mark for the very last time. Never again would he set foot in that temple. And the truth of the matter is, within one generation, within 40 years, no one would ever again set foot in that temple. That massive structure, no one again would step foot in within 40 years of Jesus taking his last step from there. When Jesus said in verse 2 to his disciple, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another which will not be torn down. When Jesus said that, he just wasn't speculating and he wasn't kidding. Because... Within 40 years, in the year 70 A.D., and I think it was in August of 70 A.D., the Roman general Titus completely destroyed that temple, sacked Jerusalem, and then in the year 691, the Muslims came in and they built a shrine to that demon Allah on top of that temple mount. It is still there today called the Dome of the Rock, where the temple where the temple that Jesus was pointing to and said not one stone will be left upon another. A Muslim shrine sits today. The temple that stood in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus Christ was not the first temple that had been built on that site. No, it was not. It was the second temple that had been built on that site. If you read in your Bibles, the very first temple was built by King Solomon about 825 B.C. That was the first temple that was built on that site. What site? The site called Mount Moriah. What site is that? It's the one where Abraham had offered Isaac as a sacrifice before God stopped it. 
that site. And the first temple was built there by King Solomon in 825 B.C. and it sat for some 400 or 420 years and then the Babylonian Empire, King Nebuchadnezzar, destroyed that temple. You can read about that in 2 Kings chapter 25. Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian army came in. They destroyed that King Solomon's temple and they took Israel captive into the Babylonian Empire. You can read that in the book of Daniel because Daniel was one of the captives and his his three friends were four of those that were taken off. You can read about that captivity in Jeremiah and in Lamentations. You can, talk, you can read about that. So that happened. This is all real. It's very historical. And when the Jews were carried away to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar, that temple area after Solomon's temple had been destroyed, it sat desolate. It sat just run down and desolate. And then approximately 520 B.C., about 300 or so years later, about 520 B.C., you can read about this in the book of Ezra, chapter 5. King Cyrus of Persia, called Cyrus the Great, conquered Babylon, and he ordered, he put an edict out and an order that the temple of the Jews would be rebuilt. And then you can read about that, book of Ezra, book of Nehemiah, about the rebuilding of the temple, you know, different places in Scripture. So that all took place. And that temple is the second temple. That is the temple that Jesus saw. And about 20 B.C., 18 to 20 B.C., Herod the Great, King Herod the Great, renovated that temple that had been built, the second temple that had been built on edict by King of Persia, Cyrus. And he, he renovated and made it the most inspiring impressive structure, the most beautiful of structures. And the renovation started in about 20 BC, and they ended roughly in about 64 AD. So even that day when Jesus is saying, not one of these stones, the, the, the final renovations weren't even finished yet. This was, thing was getting more beautiful, more beautiful as time went on. That's the structure that Jesus' disciple commented about. And if you think about this, historians say that some of the stones in that temple that Jesus said would not be remain sitting on top of each other weighed 800,000 pounds. And Jesus is just talking about, you know what, those stones that weigh 800,000 pounds just aren't going to even stay on top of each other. They're going to be torn down. Why were they torn down? Why were they dismantled? Titus had heard a rumor there was gold on the inside. Verse 3. And Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple. So there's a change of location here, note. Peter and James and John and Andrew were questioning him privately. Tell us. When will these things be? And what will be the sign when all of these things are going to be fulfilled? Now notice, Jesus is now sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple. So here's what I picture happens between verses 2 and verses 3. Jesus is walking out in verses 2, and his disciple says, Hey, look at these grand, this great building. Look at these stones. I mean, look how massive they are, Jesus. And Jesus says, You know what? Not even one of those stones is going to be left on each other. And at that point, I just think the disciples probably got quiet. And they just followed Jesus. And what did Jesus do? Jesus walked out of the temple. He walked down. He, he would have walked out of the temple. He would have walked through the gates, one of the gates in Jerusalem. This is the wall. He would have walked down the mountain, Mount Moriah, down the temple mount. He would have got down to the city of David called Zion which is at the base of the old city of Jerusalem. He would have walked across the Kidron Valley and he would have walked up onto the side of the Mount of Olives. It's a beautiful sight because on that Mount of Olives, which is actually Muslim right now mostly, but on that Mount of Olives you can sit there and you can overlook the city of Jerusalem. And we got to do it at night and it was just absolutely incredible. 
And that's what has happened. In that silence, it sounds like that they just, they're awestruck, you know, it's like dumbfounded, uh, overcome by shock, and they, they make this walk, and now they're sitting there, and privately, you know, four of the disciples go up to Jesus and say, uh, I got a question for you, Jesus. Verse 4, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all of these things are going to be fulfilled? Now Mark, right there, he records that the disciples asked two questions. And Luke says they asked the same two questions. Matthew records that they actually asked the third question. Oh, there's a contradiction, folks. No, there's not. Two of the guys just talk about two of the questions, and one talks about all three. Not a huge contradiction. All right? Matthew tells us that they asked three specific questions. Number one, when will these things happen? What things? The destruction of the temple. When will that happen? Number two, what will be the sign of your coming back, Jesus? And number three, what will be the sign of the end of the age? They asked specifically three things. Now, if they ask two questions or three questions, you know, because in Mark 13 and Luke 21, it says that they ask two questions, and Matthew 24 says they ask three. You know what? The number doesn't matter. What matters is this, that we understand that they asked more than one question. So this long answer that Jesus gives is actually an answer to multiple questions. And that is where we, we have to focus and that is where we have to have understanding because that's where people get in trouble in misrepresenting scripture like this is they think that everything in there is just respect to the answer of one question, but it's not. It's answering three specific questions. Now, what does Jesus tell them? Before he even answers the question, he says, do not be misled. Do not be deceived. All right? So you're asking me about end times, Jesus says. You're asking me about when these things are going to happen, when judgment's going to come, when I'm going to come back, when the world's going to end. You're going to ask me all these things, but the first thing you have to remember is people are out there wanting to deceive you about these things, and they want to mislead you in the truth. So do not be misled. Do not be deceived. That's going to be a whole sermon in two weeks. So we're going to bypass that. We're going to jump to verse... 7. Verse 7. Let's just go through some of these. Verse 7. Wars and rumors of wars. Verse 8. Nation will rise against nation. Verse 8. Earthquakes in various places. Verse 8. Famines. Verse 9. They will deliver you to the courts and you will be flogged in the synagogues and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them. Verse 10, the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. Verse 12, brother will betray brother to death and a father his child and the children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. Verse 13, you will be hated by all because of my name. Verse 14, the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be. Verse 19, tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of creation until now, and it never will. Verse 22, false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show signs and wonders. Those are the verses we're going to focus on today. Next week we're going to pick up after that. So we're going to stop here a moment and contemplate Jesus' answer so far. Now, were all of those statements that he made an answer to the question, when did the temple be destroyed? Or were they an answer to the question, what will be the sign of your coming? Or were they the answer to the question, what are the signs of the end of the age? Unfortunately, Jesus doesn't answer in this way. I mean, everyone in this room would like it if he would have answered it this way. All right. With respect to the destruction of the temple, the following events will take place. Now, with respect to the second coming and my second coming, A, B, and C will take place. Now, with respect to the end of the age, one, two, and three are going to happen. Wouldn't it have been so easy if Jesus just answered it that way? I think it would have. But he didn't. Why? Because the specifics are not extremely important to us. It doesn't matter. 
When I went through that list, I know some people were thinking this, because I know how people think. They were saying, hey, that's happening. Hey, that's happening too. Oh no, the end is here. Wars, earthquakes, and famines. Oh my. I know that. But before anybody goes clicking their ruby slippers together to get out of here, let me assure you of one thing. Everything we just read, it all took place already, folks. It all took place before the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D. So don't worry, don't click your slippers together, don't think you've got to leave, all of that's past history. The first century historian, in fact, I forgot the book, I got a history book about, yeah, about that big, and it's the writings of Josephus. Who was Josephus? Josephus was one of the generals that fought for the Jewish army in one of the early battles, I think it was against Vespian. And then he went on to write a history of what he witnessed in the destruction of the temple. He wrote a history called Antiquities that talks about the Jews from the beginning of creation all the way through up to that point, so we got a lot of history in that. Then he wrote the wars of the Jews. And in the wars specifically, he wrote this in about 75 AD, five years about after the destruction of the temple, Flavius Josephus writes about the destruction. Here is how he starts his history of the wars of the Jews. He begins with this first paragraph. Whereas the war which the Jews made with the Romans has been the greatest of all those. So he's talking about wars and the one that just ended with the destruction of the temple. He says that war that the Jews made with the Romans has been the greatest of all, but only that have been in our times. But in a manner of those that ever were heard of, both of those were in cities have fought against cities and nations against nations. So basically he's starting off, he's telling us this. He says, you know that war that just led to the destruction of the temple? That was just money, one of many wars. It was the greatest of all the wars. But other wars have occurred. Cities have fought against cities and nations have fought against nations. Same exact thing that Jesus says would happen. And all of that took place leading up to 70 A.D. And with respect to earthquakes in various places, one of the things that I have learned in my travels to places like Ephesus and um, some of the churches in Revelation and such, one of the things I've learned is that there are a lot of ruins in this world because of earthquakes. Total cities like Pergamum were, were destroyed by earthquake. Ephesus, earthquakes. All right, Major earthquakes destroyed major cities in 46 AD, 51 AD, 53 AD, 60 AD, 62 AD, so on and so forth. That part of the world is known for a lot of shaking going on. All right, and things fall. We talked about this on Wednesday nights. I think it was the earthquake around 5360 was when Nero was in charge, where Laodicea, Hyopolis, and Colossae were all destroyed in an earthquake. In fact, the earth actually, Matthew in chapter 27 tells us the earth was shaken when Jesus was on the cross. There was a major earthquake. And Acts 16. 26 tells us that when Paul and Cyrus, Silas were in prison, the earth shook. There was a huge earthquake. Ancient historians like Tacitus, who was Roman, Josephus, who was Jewish, and Seneca, who was Roman, they write about earthquakes all the time. Earthquakes are nothing new, folks, today. Famines. Oh, famines. Well, in Acts, Agabus, in Acts chapter 11, Agabus prophesies that a famine is going to come to the land. He says we ought to take up an offering for those that are going to be affected by the famine in Jerusalem. And that famine took place in 41 A.D. and it lasted until 50 A.D. During that same, that same period of time, there were about 13 famines throughout the Roman Empire and just 30,000 alone died in Rome. 
the big famine was in Jerusalem when the armies of Titus surrounded the city of Jerusalem. And Josephus, in his book, Six of the Wars of the Jews, records this about that famine. He says this, Now of those that perished by famine in the city, the number was prodigious, and the miseries they underwent were unspeakable. For if such... For so much as a shadow of any kind of food did anywhere appear, a war was commenced presently, and the dearest friends fell at fighting one another about it, snatching from each other the most miserable sorts of life. Nor would men believe that those who were dying had no food, but the robbers would search them, when they were expiring, lest any one should have concealed food in their bosoms and counterfeited dying. Nay, these robbers gaped for want and ran about stumbling and staggering about like mad dogs and reeling against the doors of houses like drunken men. They would also, in a great distress they were in, rush into the very same houses two or three times in one, and the same day. Moreover, their hunger was so intolerable that it obliged them to chew everything and anything while they gathered such things as the most sordid animals would not touch and endured to eat them. Nor did they at length abstain from girdles and shoes and very leather which belonged to their shields. They pulled off and gnawed. The very wisps of old hay became food to some, and some gathered up fibers. And then he goes on, I can't even read it to you, and he goes on to describe how mothers were roasting their own children, their own babies. Only to end with these words concerning the famine of those days. Those who were thus distressed by the famine were very desirous to die. And those already dead were esteemed happy because they had not lived long enough either to hear or to see such miseries. And Jesus tells them that as disciples they would be delivered up to courts and flogged and stand before witnesses, before governors and kings. And we know that that all happened. Just read the book of Acts. And Paul writes in Colossians more than once and in Romans more than once, he says that the gospel has been preached throughout the whole world. He considered the gospel already preached throughout the whole world. And we know that New Testament Christians were betrayed and they were put to death and they were hated because of Jesus' name. And what about this false Christs and false prophets will arise and show signs and wonders We'll deal with that a bit more in our sermon on the faces of deception, but let's just say this. Josephus in his history records some 14 or 15 prophets and false Christs that were performing miracles. You know, Christ being a Messiah, false messiahs that were performing miracles and leading many away from the truth of Judaism. So how about that whole abomination of desolation thing standing where it should not be? Well, that is a direct reference to Daniel chapter 12. But Jesus addresses that statement, abomination of desolation, in Luke 21. He says this, When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and those who are on the inside of the city to depart, and let not those who are out in the country enter it, for these are days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. So Jesus alludes that when the city of Jerusalem is surrounded by armies, then the desolation has occurred because the armies of Rome are where they ought not to be. Now we learned on Wednesday nights recently that in 66 AD, the Jews began a revolt against Rome which brought the war that led to the destruction of the temple and most of Jerusalem. The Jews brought that on themselves in 66 AD. Well, what happened at first? The Jews start revolting. What, what was the response of the Roman Empire? The Roman Empire called the general out of Syria 
His name was Cestus Gallus. And he moves his legions of army from Syria down to Jerusalem and he surrounds the city of Jerusalem for battle. Well, Jesus just said, when you see this army surrounding, flee, leave the city, don't enter in. Well, how can that happen if the armies are surrounding the city? Jesus, don't you know what you're talking about? Josephus writes this in Wars, book 2, chapter 19. He says this, After Cestus had the army surrounded, Josephus says that the Jews fought and surprised him. And these are the exact words, quote, And Cestus retired from the city without any reason in the world. In other words, what happened is Cestus, the army, comes in from Syria. They surround Jerusalem. Those in Jerusalem actually fought back. And Cestus says, Ooh, I'm retreating. And he just retreats for no reason. And he's gone for a short period of time. What did Jesus say when you see the army surround flee? Even if the Roman Empire didn't know Cestus was going to be a coward and flee, Jesus knew it. Jesus knew it. And Jesus said that the tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of creation until now and never will be, that that will be a time of tribulation. Has that taken place? I'll tell you what, the accounts I read of what took place in the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple, I ain't seen nothing like that anywhere in any of the rest of human history. It was pretty bad. So I think with respect to that, that is a period of great tribulation. Okay, so I just went through a lot today. Why did I just go through all of that? Why did I point to the fact this morning that everything that is in there can easily be seen in the history that led up to and the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Why? Why did I do that? It's because the Bible is not meant to be entertainment. It is not meant to be the script for a Hollywood blockbuster. I am sorry, folks. Today's message being the first part of past, present, or future, it really doesn't matter. Why did I name it that? It's because in the grand scheme of things, whether what Jesus said happened already 2,000 years ago or if it's going to happen 2,000 years from now, it's really not important. It's really not important. There is a study of Christian... You know, one of the things that we study is called eschatology. Christians have an eschatology. Everyone in this room has some eschatology. What does that mean? It means this. Everyone in this room has some belief concerning what's going to happen in the end times, in the end time events. That's what eschatology is. It's the study of the end. And every person in this room, if I say, what's going to happen that's going to cause the world to end? Everyone in here is going to have some kind of belief concerning that. Alright? Many of you will have gotten your beliefs from Tim LaHaye or Hal Lindsey, and other people will have gotten your beliefs from the Bible, and other people have gotten your beliefs from Fox News or from some Hollywood blockbuster, whatever it might be. Eschatology means the study of the end, and there are four camps in the Christian community. There are basically four different groups of people when it comes to eschatology. At times, we just need to have a sermon to educate us a little, to take us out of our ignorance. Okay? On Wednesday nights, we've talked about these four camps of eschatology concerning end times, but we know we're just going to talk about them this morning as a refresher course, and also for those who have never come on a Wednesday night. The first eschatological view is called historicism. The first vantage point of eschatology is historicism. It's a belief that passages like what we just went through in Mark and the book of Daniel and Revelation, those types of passages, a historicist believes that those books 
are describing historical events that have already happened and it's doing so in a manner to give us a spiritual insight to why that history occurred. All right. So somebody that looks at what we read in Mark 13, they will say, well, that's historical. I can tell you when that event happened, that event happened. And here is the spiritual significance of why it happened. They don't necessarily believe that those are prophetic in nature, but they're describing past events. Like a historicist would say that the book of Revelation is describing previous history and it's doing so using spiritual symbologies so that we can get an understanding of what happened and why it happened and, and learn truths of God. That's a historical look at eschatology. The second school of thought concerning end times eschatology is that of preterism. A preterist believes that passages like Mark and those found especially in places like Revelation and Daniel that those have already been fulfilled. So a preterist will tell you that the book of Revelation has already been fulfilled, Daniel has already been fulfilled, everything we just read in Mark has already been fulfilled. When was it fulfilled? More than likely they will always tell you, a preterist will always tell you that they were fulfilled in the fall and the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Why? Because do you realize this? There has not been a such a thing as a Jew since 70 AD. There has not been, it has not been possible for a single Jewish person to live their religion since 70 AD. Why? Because an integral part of the Jewish religion is temple sacrifice and there ain't been no temple. When Marilyn and I went to Jerusalem and I looked up on that temple mount, I didn't see a temple. I saw a mosque. I saw a shrine to a demon. I did not see a temple to Jehovah. So, a preterist would say that all of these things that are dealing with the end of time, the end of the age, what they're really dealing with is the end of Judaism, the end of the temple sacrifice, and it was all fulfilled. So, that is our second view of eschatology. Our third common school of eschatology is called idealism. That is a belief that the prophecies found in Scripture, again, particularly the books like Daniel and Revelation, that they are not literal at all. They are not describing anything literally, but they're allegorical in nature, meaning that they teach us spiritual things. Now, me reading Mark 13 here, where Jesus says not one stone is going to be left on another, and then within 40 years, not one stone was left on another. Kind of literal to me, so I don't think there's a lot of idealism in that passage there at all. Now the fourth school, the fourth viewpoint when it comes to Christian eschatology is called futurism. Futurism, that's what many people hold today. 